one. I'm here with Joseph Boudreaux. He is a musician, singer, and songwriter from Hamilton, Ontario, correct? That's right, yeah. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm glad that we are on the show to be on the show too. Uh, I believe uh, we are supposed to have this uh, conversation a week before, but then uh, I was busy with a lot of stuff. I'm a student, so. Oh yeah. So I would like to begin with uh, by asking you, uh, what do you have for breakfast today? <laughs> what did I have for breakfast? Um, it was a soft boiled egg, uh, salted with a uh, bagel with toast and butter. Sorry, oh, wow. bagel toasted with butter, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Um, uh, to be honest, I can't even remember what I have for breakfast today. Like, I I think upon just finishing breakfast, I just forgot what I had for breakfast. <laughs> I know that I had breakfast, but, you know. Um, what would be your ideal breakfast? My ideal breakfast is uh, uh, eggs benedict. Oh wow! Yeah, it's Benedict too. on uh, English English muffin with uh, side bacon. I don't mm -hmm. like this. I don't like smoked salmon. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now that I think about it, that would be my ideal breakfast. Yeah, but breakfast. Oh, happens to be, it happens to be my favorite meal of the day. Sometimes I have breakfast for dinner. Mm. Yeah. Like uh, having like cereal and milk. No, no, I'm. I'm beyond that. Mm. I, I can't. I can't do the uh, the packaged cereal anymore. Now that I've I've mastered the art of pancake making, I can oh. I can no longer have dried cereal. <laughs> <laughs> wow, fascinating. So yeah, uh, Hamilton, Ontario. How? What's the weather like there? Right now, it's uh, it's warmed up. In the sun, it's probably sixteen to twenty degrees. Uh, in the in the shade though it's cooler it's about six degrees um they started off overcast and cloudy it looked like it might rain mm -hmm. and around 3 p.m it uh it cleared up <laughs> all right yeah i appreciate the weather report uh, <laughs> you're welcome for, yeah for the most part i uh, for the most part I, I i get to know the weather by just uh looking outside the window and uh yeah um today's a bit cold in peterborough um it rained the day before, so it's that. Yes. I promise we will get to the music at some point. <laughs> are you uh, are you full time students? Uh, yes, I am. I am. I am. I'm almost graduating, actually. What year are you in? Uh, fourth year. Fourth year. So yeah. full time is like forty hours a week. Um, give or take, yeah. Yeah, that's that's intense. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Uh, have you been to university? Do you go to school? I went to college. Uh, no, I didn't attend university. And I'm not currently in school. I'm currently okay. working, I'm working in the trades mm -hmm. as, a, as a carpenter. Um, but yeah, no. Yeah, well, lucky you. Yeah. Uh, uh, university has its moments, but then uh, it, it can be very stressful and I would say rather absurd. But still, um, so about the about your latest EP, is this your debut uh, body of work? It is as a solo artist. It is. Um, I've I've put music out prior, yeah, uh, under multiple different names, but it was never solo. Mm -hmm. So this is my first attempt at putting together a body of work that I felt was cohesive and uh, just using my name. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you were in a band or more than. One more of than one band. Band. Yeah, what more than one band. Mm -hmm. And uh did some touring, did uh, a lot of recording, and it just became a cycle of creating something, putting effort into it, and building it to a point where just simply because of other people's life circumstances, and I just mean just mm -hmm. simply people's work or yeah. people having children, just different life circumstances, it couldn't go any further. And it just became apparent that as long as I am uh, involving people to the extent that I involve them, involve them in the project, uh, it was going to be hard to move past that stage. And by that, I mean, uh, I, uh, I don't feel comfortable replacing individuals in bands. I never, I never felt good about having 
having session players come in and just be part of the band for a period of time. And uh, everybody, everybody who was in each of those bands was a crucial part of the band. So to, to just change somebody out because they couldn't go further just felt sort of like so almost like betrayal. It wasn't brotherly. Right, I see. And I presume all of the audition process too, it can take uh, a good chunk of the time and I guess the camaraderie may not be there. No. Oh, absolutely, you're right. I did, I did do a very short period of auditions for one circumstance and it was uncomfortable. And I just decided this isn't not this. It's not the way that I'd like to do this. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the name of the last band that you were in? Yeah, the last band that I was in was uh, it was a duo. It was called Lucid Lee and Little Child. Okay. And it was uh, like a folk yeah. folk rock with a bit of uh, pop folk pop mm -hmm. influence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I could say quite the same about uh, the five songs that were in your extended play, Yesterday's Today EP. Yeah, it, it, it is folk rock with a tinge of pop and I will say indie. And I, I listened to uh, the album in its entirety yesterday and I, I like it quite a bit. Um, Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, I believe uh, my favorite tracks are track number three, the title the title song and the final one which is uh i believe it's a medley or of uh two songs too soon goodbye oh uh, yeah yes. i i appreciate that you liked that one that one was sort of like a in the in the development of that song and the writing and then the recording it transformed so many times and uh it sort of took on i can kind of see how you you say medley like the title itself mm -hmm. is I guess it suggests that it's sort of two songs put together, but it's real. It was really written as one song. It was sort of the way we executed the recording of it that it kind of takes on the feel of maybe different parts just put together. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, so, uh, what was the recording process like for you? It was a very long process, um, and I was fine with that because. I had agreed with the producer, uh, who's a very good friend, very old friend of mine, uh, Adam Cannon. Um, we agreed that we were going to take our time and do the things necessary to the music to produce the sound that I would that I would be happy with listening to ten years from now. And I didn't want to rush anything, which I'd done in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, the result of that is just never really being satisfied with the product. Um, or, the, or the, the quality of the songs. Um, so I started out the recording by firstly, uh, just doing like some rough rough tracks to, to play the drums and the bass too. Um, and we went to Catherine North Studio, which is a pretty well-known studio in Hamilton uh, to record the drums and the bass. And we did that in a day and then the those tracks sat for a couple months uh, while I moved into the same building that Adam lives in. Uh, and I lived on the ground floor of his apartment and he lived right above me. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we began actually breaking it into recording sessions, it turned into a weekly recording session on Wednesdays. And every Wednesday at 10 a.m., I would make a pot of coffee and go up to Adam's place and we would record for six hours or we would just mix and it was it was a very long uh, uh sort of combination of mix sessions and recording uh we, we mixed as we went so there the final mixes are very very close to the the uh the way the songs were recorded just because because we mixed as we went um and then uh adam is also he's a musician as well and he's in a number of bands and uh, we took uh, about eight months off of it and it, we both grew completely impatient with the project. And then uh, after like a little bit of a break, uh, I think we both just had the energy to motor through the end and get the stuff that we needed and just do the final, the, the final touches on the songs to get to the finish line, to get it mastered. 
And uh, I was also mastering Hamilton by a guy who's got this amazing studio, um, John Tornblom. And, uh, and all the while I was sort of just uh, putting together a release plan and uh, I had re started rehearsing with a band and I had a group of music musicians together. And, uh, and then the pandemic happened mm -hmm. and everything stopped. And it was just the most confusing place to be in. At, the, at that time, I was working on a construction job in Dundas, which is just a little bit down the road. And I was leaving work some days to just jump into a recording session. And uh, it just felt like really busy and really great and productive and super creative because of the way we were doing it. I was just really able to think about, I was able to do a piece of recording, leave for a week, come back and like have thought about what we did. Adam would send me some bounces. I'd be able to review them and then have like a sort of concrete idea of what I wanted to achieve with what we, he was giving me. And, uh, and then when the pandemic happened, it just, it all stopped. But at that point, the recording was done and we had decided that we were not going to do any more. So we sort of just like, we finished up the mixes, got it mastered. And when it became apparent to me that the pandemic wasn't going to be like ending sure. soon, like at, at the very beginning of the whole thing, nobody really knew what, how long this was going to be. People were talking about a year and like now it's, we're into a year and it's still going on. So I just decided in June that I'm going to put this out because I had grown uh, I didn't want to grow resentful of the, the project. I didn't want to uh, feel distant from the songs. Mm -hmm. So I just I just decided to release it. Let's see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm guessing you have not uh, performed these live in, in a live setting. I did play a couple of acoustic shows before everything happened, but it was mm -hmm. just to test some material out. So that was, I'm talking, that was like three years ago now. Oh, wow. It's It, it really like mind-blowing to me to think mm -hmm. about the timeline of this because the last year nothing's happened in the last year and it's just added another year to the timeline of the whole project mm -hmm. yeah uh, i think when i think about it uh for the most part independent artists they they make much of uh you know their living by or their revenue by by performing and i wonder uh so you've uh, made this uh so if you've made this body of work, this album, this EP, and you put a lot of time and effort into it, and you find that yeah, um, and you find that you know uh, you don't really want to spend any more second working on it anymore. But then of course the next stage is you gotta learn all these songs so that you have to perform them and repeatedly. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's really been dragged out. It's so crazy that like how this industry has been affected. I mean, it's, it's crazy how everything's been affected. I don't want to, I don't want to sound like this is more profound than anything else, but I'm experiencing it firsthand. Like the, the month when I released it, I was relentlessly contacting radio hosts, mm -hmm. uh, but I couldn't even get my music into the, the community radio stations and like the college stations because radio stations were shut down because campuses were shut down. Wow. So I couldn't even get radio play for the EP. Mm -hmm. So that's that's actually how come like approaching a year after it's been released, I'm still trying to plug it. And I'm still, I'm really thankful that people like you are willing to look at music that's approaching a year old now. Because on on thing, on platforms like Spotify, uh, playlisters don't touch anything that's past, like mm -hmm. past six months. Rarely will they touch something that's past three months old. So it's sort of like a... Uh, working against time with the music um but yeah definitely of course yeah and i'm glad to have you on as well i think um uh, i um uh, the thing about trend radio is that they they always uh, are on the lookout for music from smaller artists because uh they have this uh, non-competitive cause with uh another station which uh, prohibits us from playing anything from top 40 radio like any song that has ever been on the top 40 is uh oh that's crazy i didn't know that well um i think it's better because uh if a song happens to be a hit there's a very much a likelihood that it gets played over and over and over again yes yeah and so uh i always um 
so I'm always looking out for for new music to to promote, to put on, and of course, I would like to know the creative process of the musicians. That's fantastic. I actually uh, I used to have a radio show at McMaster in mm -hmm. Hamilton, and I had artists in, and I recorded them live in studio. McMaster has a, a fairly large size room with microphones built into it wow. and i was recording them in studio and doing an interview and uh i was also in the band at the time but i was really just i, I felt like i was really in love with the music scene and i i think in i had a previous radio show but that one wasn't as as focused on the local music scene um and i think in that experience i i really gained a uh, like a deep appreciation for community radio because mm -hmm. like Spotify happens, SoundCloud happens, all that stuff happens and community radio still exists. And community radio is like where artists like me can actually get uh, somebody's time of day to talk about the, the work that I put in. Oh well, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I have enjoyed, uh, I have enjoyed working uh, at uh, trend radio too. Uh, even though, um, uh, it, you know, the radio station itself is not open, but uh, we still upload stuff from our home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think, uh, of course, the best thing is uh, to uh, to find people to interview because I, like I said, I really enjoy talking about this, these kinds of stuff. And well, um, the city that I grew up in, uh, I'm, I'm actually Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Hanoi, even though it's a, giant city um i don't know many people if not anyone who who is interested in in music at least the way i do oh interesting. yeah and of course there are no there are no bands performing in garages because the houses are t way too close to each other and garages uh -huh. are not really a thing oh okay yeah okay yeah and so uh, I'm guessing, do you perform music live in radio stations if you ever had like one or two radio oh, yeah. interviews here and there? Yeah, yeah. I absolutely love, I loved preparing for, uh, there's a guy in Hamilton, uh, his name is Rick Taylor, and he was, uh, he's got a show on McMaster Radio, and he was like the, he's a really good interviewer, but he's like kind of old school interviewer. He mm -hmm. wasn't talking so much about like the process, he was more talking about like just like your life and the, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the music. And mm -hmm. um, I used to love preparing to go on his show because I knew he was going to grill me and ask me some questions that I had to really think about. And uh, he gave me an opportunity to play on, on air. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, anytime I did any radio interviews, I always took my acoustic guitar in the, in the off chance that they would give me an opportunity to uh, sing a song. Great, awesome. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've uh, I've had a lot of musicians coming on my show, and I try not to commit the cardinal sin of asking them, "Hey, I like this song of yours. What does it mean?" <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, but uh, I I like uh, the um, I like uh, the approach of uh, what's it uh, Rick Taylor, mm -hmm. your Hamilton radio host, is that mm -hmm. he he asks around about like the details of your life because. Um, uh, whether you whether you you know you do it on purpose or not, the recording of uh, of music of any song contains some of your life details in it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, huh. um, and I do hope you uh, throughout all of the long arduous sessions you had breakfast beforehand. <laughs> I'm actually I don't actually like eating breakfast. In the morning, I, uh, I wait until I wait until about eleven thirty or twelve to have something to eat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, my sessions were usually they'd be broken up. There'd be a lunch session uh -huh. in the middle of the recording, so that I could take a minute to just clean our ears and uh, get some food. All right. So you're like a brunch fellow then. Yes. Yes. I, I don't have much of an appetite at seven in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think of myself as as that as well and i think that unless unless i'm obligated to there's no way in hell you could drag me out bed at seven in the morning <laughs> i think maybe that's why i cannot be a bus driver and there's also because i cannot drive you can't drive no i cannot i'm, I'm only in my early 20s and yeah 
I, uh, I'm, I'm 34 and I only got my license last year. Oh. I've gone my entire life. Actually, that's not true. When I was 16, I had a bit of a license. I had my learning license. I avoided driving for the most part of my life. I didn't want to, I didn't want to drive. And now I drive and I just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I don't picture myself as a driver, but uh, I think um, I think my I think uh, if I ever get a license or car of my own, I think the one of the first thing I would do is to drive it to the farthest gas station I can find, and then refill the tank. Drive back. Yeah, that's a great that's a great road adventure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, also you get to know all of the gas stations that that you you pass through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, your uh, perform your experience as a live performer. What what would be uh, what do you think uh, can you remember are the most and least fun gigs that that you had? Oh, okay. The uh, okay. Let me really think about this for a sec. I know there's been, I can't think of this uh, particular circumstance, but I know that there's been times when I felt so uncomfortable and so shy and embarrassed on stage. Mm -hmm. And I was too, I was sort of like too novice or too green to really know that something's wrong. I should just stop. And I should tell somebody at the sound booth to do something to fix this for me or tell them what I need fixed. But at that time, I just, I can, I can really clearly picture being like sort of stuck in the song and the, the motion and the wave of the song just kind of pulling me along. So I just kept going and kept strumming and kept singing, mm -hmm. but really just like feeling inward, not being able to think about what's going on outside uh i can't i know that that's happened to me i can't think of a like a particular circumstance uh or like a specific moment but um yeah that feeling is something that i actually i dread uh but i learned to make sure that everything is like set up right and that i, I can hear myself clearly in the monitors um the uh the best experience i've ever had uh I think there was a there was a festival that I played with the Monarch Project, which was one of my earlier bands, uh, and it was outdoors, and it was on a raised platform. It was quite high, and the audience wasn't necessarily there to see the bands. There it was just this huge festival happening, right? And and there's people just sort of passing through mm -hmm. during our set. And, uh, and I can just remember, uh, playing one of our songs. I think the song was called a better part of you. And I can just remember playing it and the breeze picking up. And it just felt like I was experiencing a moment that was connecting me with all these people who were hearing this and all stopped to see. And it was, it's like that type of feeling of really knowing that like I'm, I'm, my game is on and that I'm singing well, and that the band sounds good, and that the sound is being carried out to the audience well, and that everybody probably felt the breeze at the same time, and it was like a hot day, so it was probably a cool breeze, and I could just feel my hair blowing or something like it. it's, uh, yeah, something like that. I think that's probably one of the best experiences I had. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I, I, can, I haven't, I think I've only performed like songs I've always sung in public like two or three times but uh, I think uh, my my worst uh, my worst experience uh, as a sort of like a public performance thing is when I have these uh, class presentations and we have these uh, PowerPoints files beforehand mm -hmm. and I think the the worst moments are always the ones where you try to open it and you try to open these files and they they do not open <laughs> or, or yeah 
or you found out that the files are sort of like corrupted in some ways or they cannot display oh, properly. Yeah, and so I, you're there yeah, and you're there. And, and you're, just, you're, yeah. you're standing there and like on the verge of pissing your pants and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> I, uh, I can kind of relate to that. Actually, we played a Halloween show once. We were really young and uh, me and my friend Brian dressed up as like, I think what people would probably consider now is inappropriate costumes. We were dressed with... Uh, fedoras and uh just like spanish cultural attire it was just sort of like dumb but we were young and right. we just is it like mariachi a, band kind, of, kind yeah, of thing yeah right okay so okay. like maybe a little bit inappropriate but at the time we didn't think about it and honestly we didn't mean anything by it um but we uh we took full advantage of the uh the open bar for us and we right. absolutely slammed and then had to perform and there was that was probably my actual worst performance because i was i just remember being so inebriated that i had to seriously think about how to play the guitar mm -hmm. and that's not really like I, I play the guitar every single day i don't really think about it and uh yeah, to be that inebriated was that was just an inexperienced sort of move. So, how long has uh, how long has your acquaintanceship with the guitar been? Oh, um, well, I am thirty four, uh, so eighteen years I've been playing guitar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, got a guitar when I was. I think I bagged my mom for a guitar and she kept saying, no, no, you, you're not getting a guitar. I don't know why, but I think it was because she wanted to give it to me for Christmas. So on my 16th birthday, or sorry, on Christmas on my 16th year, she uh, gave me a guitar and I was just like over the moon. I was that kid in high school who I carried my guitar with me everywhere to every single class. I skipped class to sit in the hallway and practice guitar I would spend lunches in the back hallway by the gymnasium practicing guitar. I just love the guitar. And uh, yeah, that's all right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, my next question is, uh, what was the first song that you learned? Uh, oh, uh, was it an acoustic or electric? And what was the first song that you learned on the guitar? And and I, uh, you mentioned in the email that your music in, is influenced by Oasis in some kind. and this is something that I do not hope for. Your answer being Wonderwall. <laughs> no, definitely not. Okay, but good, good. I do know how to play that. Um, my first guitar was an acoustic. And uh, it was not a very good acoustic. It was probably like a $200 acoustic, maybe not even $200. Mm -hmm. But my parents aren't wealthy. And it was good enough for me to learn on. So I'm, th I'm grateful that I got that guitar. But I, I later smashed that guitar to pieces, um, as you do with a, a toy you grow old of, or you're tired of. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the first song that I learned, I don't think I was learning full songs. I, I think I went down the route of learning uh, specific riffs because I was sort of still discovering music. I at sixteen, I. Like growing up, I was really into pop music because it was on the radio and I didn't really make up my own choice. And my parents were sort of like, like my mom introduced us to Queen and to Cat Stevens and uh, like Steppenwolf. Mm -hmm. So that's stuff my, my mom introduced us to, but I just sort of like thought of it as like old people music and I didn't really want to touch that because it was like old people music mm -hmm. and my dad my dad introduced me to like uh actually my dad introduced me to bagpipe music like traditional folk music wow. um and uh that sort of didn't really fit into the realm of guitar for me i didn't really think of traditional music like mm -hmm. uh folk or uh celtic stuff as a music that i was able to like incorporate into what i wanted to create and uh, so I went through my phase of being into pop music, and then growing up, I, I, uh, I was influenced by my peers who were into uh, 
stuff like Corn and Slipknot, and there was that whole phase in the 90s or early Korn. 2000s. Yeah, early 2000s, I guess. Yeah, new metal. Was, yeah, like that was, everybody was into it. And I, man, I used to draw the little figurine on the cover of Corn's uh, album called. It's been so long, but I can still picture that little doll, the rag doll on their album cover. Right. Um, oh, it's called Issues. That's the uh -huh. album. Name. Oh my gosh, okay. my memory is, astounds me sometimes. Um, I used to draw that all the time. So I was really into that. And then it was in high school when I, I don't even know how I came across Oasis, but it had something to do with the advent of file sharing. And right. I got heavily into trading bootlegs online. Mm -hmm. And this was, there was a period in time when like people were paying for bootlegs online, like wave files or wow. flat file bootlegs. Yeah. Huh. and I was acquiring some and I was selling some to people and I was, I was buying some myself and I, I was getting little bits of Oasis that were sort of like a lot of B-sides. So I started falling in love with these songs and I asked my mom for a CD and for, for my birthday, she gave me a copy of Definitely Maybe and she, right. gave me, she gave me a copy of the album Familiar to Millions, which is mm -hmm. their last album. And the live album completely changed like everything for me. I just like, I heard this, the sound of this band and the, this album starts with 500,000 people screaming Oasis. And it was just like, what is this? This mm -hmm. is something else. So I was like, I felt like I was alone in high school, like listening to Oasis. I, people used to make fun of it because of Wonderwall. <laughs> just the, the same way people make fun of like, Chad Kruger, like that kind of stuff. There was that sort of mentality, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so like I'm totally on a rant. Uh, so oh, fine. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It was like it was that, and my mom like kept slipping me little bits of music that were like really really cool to me. And then it was early two thousands, and the vines were on TV, and got in got into the vines and got into uh coldplay and uh and uh, i guess the, the very first song that i learned was uh off of uh standing on the shoulder of giants it's by oasis it's called go let it out and it's really right. sim it's really simple mm -hmm. uh but it's just a it's just a chord it's a it's an a seventh chord really for the most part and that was the first experience i had where i had i was sitting at my computer i had my speakers on listening to the song and playing along to it and learning how to play with a recording. And then that, that translated to being in my bedroom with my records, listening to, listening to guitar licks, like mimicking other guitar players' style or their sounds, learning guitar solos. I learned every single guitar, every single guitar part off of Definitely Maybe. And that is, that is how I learned really how to play lead guitars, was just playing Definitely Maybe parts with the oh. record yeah mm -hmm. um but i can also like remember like very clearly learning how to play the riff from uh, uh holy crap i cannot believe that this name is escaping me right now hold on one sec come together right my gosh, my gosh. learning that learning that uh you know the riff from come together goes kind of this like that that was one of the very first things I learned and then I learned of course right just like everybody who plays guitar um, and uh, I don't know then it, I got into some other stuff that was like uh, America I can't remember how to play that stuff now though it's been so many years um, uh, a horse with no name, right? America the band? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not very good with names. It's something, something that I really struggle with. I hate being that guy that always says, you know that thing that, that <laughs> show that, or like, you know, <laughs> there's always one of those people. I'm that guy. Yeah. Uh, is it, uh, I remember this. It's a joke from the Kevin Smith movie, Clerks, where one of the guys is running a 
video store and he constantly get asked questions like, you know that movie with that guy that was in this other movie last year? Like <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. That's actually me. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Um, there was a, uh, there was a period in time when all of my brothers were playing instruments and my youngest brother, who's eight years younger than me, he, uh, he had a drum kit in the basement and he was taking drum lessons. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we were, we were jamming in our basement and we were just playing covers of songs that we were into. Like that's where, that's when I got really into the vines. Um, mm -hmm. they had that album highly evolved, which was just like a really sick rock album that kind of influenced, or, sorry, that referenced Nirvana and a lot of 60s pop mm -hmm. in a really great way. Um, and uh, we were like learning those songs. And, uh, and that's sort of like where I learned to jam was just like jam with my brothers, like maybe for better or for worse, because being the older brother, I'm kind of bossy to them. So maybe that influenced how I am with like in a jam session with mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, are you the oldest one or? Yeah, I've got three younger brothers. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what did, what did they play? Uh, well, two of them played bass guitar. Mm -hmm. My my brother Ben, he's my third or the second brother. He uh, uh, he was a singer in an emo like rock band in that period of time when like you know the black eyeliner and the super sure. tight skinny jeans were a thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so he played bass. My my brother Alec played bass guitar as well in. Uh, in like a math rock kind of band Ooh. and uh and my youngest brother Walter plays drums mm -hmm. yeah I see sounds like the, the premise for a family band yeah. well that's what I that's what I always dreamed of yeah yeah oh, I still I still ask my brothers if they want to play together and anytime I'm about to start a project I always ask my my brother Walter before I before I include another drummer I ask him if he'll join mm -hmm. so I hope one day that he will because it's just like it's, this, it's sort of the same idea as like I said a little while ago about the uh, betrayal or the, the not being brotherly. It that's sort of what it, like where it comes from. I think having this uh, sort of unspoken agreement that we're we're like the first band, and mm -hmm. if anything that comes after, I've got to like clear with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can understand that. I think uh, maybe that's why that's why the the, the Rolling Stones they, they stay with each other for all these decades, despite the fact that Jagger and Richards probably like their their sort of like fondness for each other probably yeah. ended in the eighties or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're totally right. There's like there's a bond in a band that is sort of uh, it's never talked about, but like the the experiences you have like there's so much growth that happens individually when uh you're exploring different things like that this it's the same kind of growth that you have in a relationship with somebody if you if you start a relationship in your 20s and you go into your 30s with that person you become a completely different person but there you you have this this part of you this period of time that you were with that person will forever be with that person and it's the same with the band it's like I put six or seven years into a band and uh, I, I have some obligation to keep a, like a vow to them. That's what it feels like. Yeah. Uh, do you miss being in a band? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Playing, playing guitar alone is just not the same. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I substitute, I substitute by setting up my eight track and doing some demos and do some recording down here, but uh, it's still not the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, do, you, do you miss, if you ever do have uh, have those occasions where I'm guessing uh, there's a car and you drive across city to city and you don't really want to be late and every one of you needs a uh, bathroom break, so you just resort to pissing in like beer bottles? <laughs> if, if that ever happens to you. If not, it should. <laughs> What's the, I, uh, we never pissed in beer bottles, but there is a, 
there was a photograph of me and four of the guys staying on the side of the road, all just taking a leak into a field. Well, that's that could be like an album art. You know, I hope uh, not. <laughs> I hope yeah, not. It's, uh, it's like uh, it's like the Who's album, Who's Next, right? You got like all the guys just uh, zipping up their fly while they're like, while there are these puddles in a monolith. You remember that? Is that what is going on in that photograph? Yes. yes oh my god, Ben! You just—I cannot believe I gotta find that. I just yeah. right here in his desk somewhere. I can't believe that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's uh, great! It's my all-time favorite rock album. Every song in there is worth playing. Uh, yeah, replaying all over it again. Wow, I can't believe that I never noticed that though. Thank you. That's uh, because that's like an iconic album cover. Mm -hmm. Just never yeah. realized it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so, how are you holding up during this uh, pandemic that we all happen to share? I uh, <clears throat> I'm fine because I work. I have okay. I I started some projects before our last lockdown, so I I worked through the lockdown, so I wasn't limited to my neighborhood and my house. I was actually working in some like I'm not like trying to brag, but I'm really lucky because I kind of forgot the lockdown even happened because I was working in like a beautiful area on the lake. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, musically, I'm like, it, it's really sucking. Trying to coordinate the beginning of another recording project with Adam has been really tiresome. And uh, the sort of like the vagueness of like the, the duration of this whole period is like really, it's, it's sort of not fair in that way because we don't want to start something and then have to stop. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, um, a very good friend of mine, his name is Jose. He played guitar on that song, Too Soon Goodbye. He played oh. the guitar solo. Oh, wow. Um, and him and I, I love working with Jose because he he's down to work with me the way I like to work. So that guitar solo wasn't just played. It was it was a written piece. We spent, uh, we spent a lot of hours uh, developing this idea that all came from, like if you listen to it closely, the, the guitar solo starts. And it all started from that. And I just wanted to capture that, the 16th note delay happening. And then we started building phrases and uh, I, I really miss working with him. And he's unable to come over because some of his family is, uh, they're really ill and they're immune compromised. So if something happened, I didn't want to be responsible and he doesn't want to risk anything. So him and I haven't seen each other in months, but prior to this past lockdown, uh, he was coming over and we were, we were developing a whole bunch of new ideas and uh, I got some demos done, but it, it all just sort of stopped. And I actually just texted him the other day. I woke up and I just thought like, holy crap, when's the last time I saw Jose? Where has all the time gone? What happened to that music? Luckily, we document all those ideas with recordings, but it's just like, I completely forgot about all this because work happened, then this crazy lockdown and life just gets away and yeah. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, yeah, of course, I think when you are at work, when you're really busy, time seems to go by really mm -hmm. fast. And mm -hmm. I think that that may be why, that, that is maybe one of the reasons why I, I've managed to, uh, get through this period of lockdown because uh, I do immerse myself with a lot of things that uh, engage me and this uh, this project is uh, is one of them yeah I uh, I've actually got the the idea of interviewing people when when lockdown I think it was like a few months in so yeah yeah that's that so that's a great idea because you're like we're we're just meeting I'm a stranger and we're having like a pretty personal conversation, I would say. Oh. And, and I think this is actually like a, a good way to sort of like break your little, your close social bubble. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's my intent, actually. Oh. But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a really fun time chatting with you, Joseph Boudreaux of Hamilton. And uh, so we're almost out of time now. So any closing words that you would like to offer me and the audience of uh, Trend Radio? Any closing words? Mm -hmm. Damn. Um, should it be good or should it just kind of be like, 
I no, I don't because <laughs> I don't have anything prepared. I don't. Uh, I don't know what I should say. Well, uh, how about something that uh, made you laugh? <sighs> something that made me laugh. Hold on. You know what I have to do? This broke my brain actually, and I never considered this. Sort of like that uh, that who album cover. Uh, are you familiar with the Oreo meme? Um, the Oreo meme. The Oreo meme. I'm I, I'm familiar with Oreo cookies. Yes, but do you know that if you take an Oreo apart, it's no longer an Oreo, and then you can put it back together, and it changes what it is. Oreo. O and Rio. O and O. Oreo, Rio. Re, 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 re. Oh, Oreo. Ore, ore, re, re, ore. Ore, ore, ore. Re, re, o. Re, ore. Ore, re, 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 oh. Oh, re, 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 oh. Oh, re, 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 oh. There's a video that goes along with that. And the video is somebody disassembling the cookie and the 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 top cookie is the O and the filling is the re and the bottom cookie is the other O and they reassemble it. So I guess for radio purposes, this doesn't make any sense. Because <laughs> it's just gonna, right. be, it's gonna be somebody saying Oreo. Uh you know what? No, I don't I don't have anything profound to say, and I don't like to say something when I'm put on the spot like that that isn't profound. Uh stay healthy. Oh, that's good enough. Yeah, <laughs> and also I think uh, yeah uh, the the image of uh, someone disassembling an Oreo is a good one to leave it, and also the image of uh, you know eight year old you or me just uh, you know taking the how you call it taking the cream fillings of all Oreos and then yes. you stack on top of each other and then you create a, like a giant Oreo tower cream tower thingy. You could take all of the cream filling and just not have any cookie and just have cream filling. Wow. <laughs> okay, okay. That's a bold one. That's a, that's yeah. a level of boldness that, <laughs> that uh, is very much unheard of. <laughs> All right. All right. Cool. Well, with, Thanks, uh, with that laughter, Joseph Boudreaux from Hamilton, singer, musician, songwriter of the uh, EP Yesterday's Today. Have a good day, man. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thanks for the talk. It's nice to meet you. Nice meeting you too.